Writing Matters with Dr. Troy Hicks is a writable podcast. Find more episodes and subscribe on your favorite platforms. And if you want to learn how to grow great writers, check out writable.com. In this episode of Writing Matters, I speak with Brian Kissel. Brian is the author of When Writers Strive the Workshop from Stenhouse and is also the director of elementary education and early childhood education programs at Vanderbilt. We talked about his history as an elementary teacher and literacy coach and focusing on the child as a writer, what it means to support, encourage, and provide feedback to these writers as they grow their own practice. Welcome to Writing Matters. Today, we speak with Brian Kissel, who is the author of the Stenhouse title, When Writers Drive the Workshop. He's a former elementary teacher and literacy coach and is currently the director of elementary education and early childhood programs at Vanderbilt. Welcome. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for being here today. And as um, we were talking and getting ready, we were sharing some of our experiences uh, about parenthood and so forth. And uh, I know that your kids are on break today, and so you're joining <laughs> us from a particular location in your home. <laughs> I'm joining you from a purple from a purple room, uh, my daughter's my daughter's room um, here in my home. My I have my kids parceled out around the house um, quietly on uh, a TV or a device, <laughs> and so so that I can you know have a nice quiet thirty minutes with with you guys. So. <laughs> So enjoy the ambiance of a purple room behind that, me. <laughs> that sounds good. Maybe we'll talk about screen time before we get all done here. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, as we get started, though, I've been asking all my guests this season to tell us a little bit about your path and yeah. how you've gotten to where you're at, at at this stage of your educational career. Yeah, you know, I think... Um, you know, I think I have a, an interesting kind of path to, to education. So I grew up in Florida. Um, I grew up in Orlando, actually, not too far away from Disney World. And um, I really grew up in, in kind of this privileged type of um, life in that my um, father was a, an, interna- an international businessman, and he traveled all over the world. And so during the summer... Um, during summers, he would take us with him. So we, we got a chance as kids really to kind of see the world um, alongside him and my mom. Um, but what I really saw from him was just the misery in his, in his eyes uh, because I knew he was just miserable at work. He, he worked long hours and he was not home very often. In fact, he, um, he took a job part of his job was working overseas for three weeks out of the month and then he would come home for a week. So um, I think he just felt a lot of pressure supporting our family and he just, he really wasn't happy. So uh, it took quite a toll, uh, I think on our relationship. And, um, and I think that um, I, I kind of resented his job. So I thought to myself as a kid, um, there, I do not want to do what he did. I, I wanted to do something completely different. And I remember at one point him saying to me, um, you have two paths. You can go quick and miserable and just make enough money so that then you can go and enjoy the rest of your life. Or you can pick some sort of job where it's slow and you can be content. Um, and I kind of, I've always thought that that was kind of a sad statement <laughs> that my dad made because I thought, <laughs> what a waste, you know, what a waste of part of your life, you know, where, um, why not make, try to make a difference if, if you're, you know, in this world for only a short amount of time, I, I just, I just didn't want to do that. I wanted to take a different path. Um, so when I was deciding what I wanted to be when I grew up, I knew I wanted to do something really different than, than what he did. Um, and so I really was teetering between two different, um, job ideas. I either wanted to be a journalist uh, because I love to write and um, I was part of the school newspaper and that was just a passion of mine. Um, or I wanted to be an educator because I've always, um, I don't know, I've always kind of thought teaching would be a, a good pathway for me. So um, I, I took the opposite path to my father and, and became a poor teacher. <laughs> so, um, but I think since becoming a um, since becoming a teacher, I think I've had like a really rich life. 
Um, so many great things have happened um, since I've become a teacher. Um, I met my wife. We were both teachers at the same school together. Um, I met her when she was outside her classroom um, putting up a bulletin board. And I thought, wait, wait a second, who's that? She had taken over a maternity leave of somebody who had left work. Um, and so uh, and she just caught my eye and, and um, we met at school as teachers in the same school. And um, a couple of years later, we got married. Uh, I became a, a, a literacy coach in a district where, I mean, this was unusual. It's still unusual at the time, but I was a literacy coach in a district in which writing was mandated for an hour. Every mm -hmm. class in the school, every elementary um, classroom had to teach writing for an hour. And um, we had a superintendent that um, kind of um, imposed that on there. So, um, so none of us knew what to do because none of us had been prepared to teach writing uh, mm -hmm. in our classes. So, you know, m most of us had teacher prep programs that, that never even really had a course on teaching writing. So we literally had no idea what to do. And um, what our district did was they had people come um, from Teachers College. Uh, the Teachers College, uh, I don't know if it was the Reading and Writing Project at the time, but I do mm -hmm. know it was people that were uh, working with Lucy Calkins. Mm -hmm. And the, this woman came and did like a year-long professional development with us. She would come every, maybe once a month, and literacy coaches would go or actually uh, classroom teachers, I was a classroom teacher at the time, would go and she would teach us all these different mini lessons and it really just kind of transformed my life. It completely opened up my writing world and really, frankly, made me become somewhat obsessed with teaching writing in my classroom. Um, during that time, I also was just immersing myself in all these like really great books. So I read Lucy's um, Art of Teaching Writing. I read Don Graves' um, Teachers, Children at Work, uh, writing teachers and children at work. I read In the Middle, Fighting It's Out Well, even though I was an elementary teacher, um, I read her book. And then I read When, um, when Writers Read by Jane Hansen. And I think the two books that I most connected with were Don's book and Jane's book. And I, and I really wanted to learn from them. I knew that they, they were at the University of New Hampshire at some point, um, but Don had retired and Jane had moved to the University of Virginia. So I headed to the University of Virginia and I got my PhD there so I could study with Jane. And since then, I've been a professor. I was at University of North Carolina at Charlotte for many years. And now I just recently moved um, here to Nashville where, um, where I work at Vanderbilt. I'm still, still teaching writing, and, but now I'm a, in a different kind of position. I'm in a, uh, somewhat of an administrative position with the elementary program. And I, I see myself in that position as somebody who's going to continue to advocate for writing and making sure that we are going to be teaching writing to our, to our students. So that, that's my path. That's amazing. And I, I, you said a couple things that I, I think are pretty interesting. You, you made that uh, analogy of being a poor teacher, but with a rich life. And yeah, I think sometimes... Yeah. Uh, you know, we could get on a whole other tangent about the way right. in which the, the public bargain with teachers and what they were entitled to or suggested to have has maybe been broken in the last 10, 20 years. But at the very yeah. least, I, I do appreciate what you're saying that it's not about the money. It, it's about what you're able to give and what you receive in return. And then also, you know, I, I'm really curious to hear more um, kind of having the same intellectual roots in mm. the Graves and Murray, the mm. Calkins and Atwell, the writing workshop, yeah. that approach. And um, I think that we are definitely uh, pedagogically aligned in that manner. So tell me a little bit more. How does that infuse your teacher education program? What does that look like, as you said, to be an advocate for the teaching of writing as you're thinking about leading other faculty and leading, mm -hmm. I'm assuming, dozens, if not hundreds yeah. of pre-service candidates? Well, I think it means we devote time to teaching writing. And that is oftentimes the thing that's cut from curricula. I think, um, I think what happens in the school systems, which I think is what ha has happened in teacher prep systems, is that um, because reading and math are the two subject areas that are tested, those are hyper-focused on. 
uh, and I know in the K-12 system, but what I'm really realizing, what I really felt um, being part of the university system in, in North Carolina was that was really being um, enacted upon within the system as well. That we, um, when I was in North Carolina at the time, we had um, a, uh, a chancellor of the school system. Uh, we had 14 university school systems. And that person was Margaret Spellings, who was um, one of the archite architects of No Child Left Behind. And some of, <laughs> and she has since left um, uh, as, as being head of the school system. But what started happening in North Carolina was that um, they were really scrutinizing how we were teaching reading and how we were teaching our literacy courses. Um, a lot of the um, science of reading um, stuff that is out there right now has was starting to kind of filter into our systems to the point where they were gathering our syllabi and um, scrutinizing what types of readings that we were doing, what types of assignments we were doing. And I felt more and more that um, my philosophy of teaching reading and writing was really under assault. So, um, so that is some of the things that I'm really worried about is um, what I really appreciate about the work that Don did and Nancy and Jane and, and Lucy and all these other people, what I think was at the heart of their message was that we need to center the child. Like the child is in the middle of all of this and we need to make sure that we construct our instruction so that, um, so that we are, that we are really like growing the writer, growing the reader and not just enacting a curriculum um, that is somehow divorced from the reader and the writer. So that is kind of my message to teachers when I'm working in, um, in my classes. I, I'm always talking to them about center the writer, put the writer in the middle, um, devote time to, to help the writer develop. Um, certainly make sure that they have choices. You know, it, it shouldn't be some canned curriculum where we're letting a, a prescriptive curriculum tell us what we do in our classrooms got to um we've got to create a space where children's voices can emerge and that really comes from them making the decisions about what they write about what they read so 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 much of their work is just now part of my dna <laughs> you know it just mm -hmm. i read their work um it's embedded within real classrooms with real kids mm -hmm. A lot of their work centers around, um, you know, studying a, a child's piece of writing and then making decisions about where we could take that child next as a learner. And I just have always connected with, with their work because I think it's, uh, it has always been centered on the child. And um, so that's what I really try to promote in my classes um, when, I talk, when I talk with them about teaching writing in the classrooms. Yeah. Again, I think that we share some very deep philosophical yeah. roots and principles, and and I appreciate that you're trying to imbue that spirit throughout your whole program yeah. and keeping the child at the center and honoring the experiences that they bring, and then also thinking about what it is that we need to do to help move this child forward as well as the whole class forward on any particular writing skill or reading strategy or those types of things. So as you kind of think about that then, and, and you think back to your teaching and literacy coaching days, as you think about the candidates that you work with, I, I know there are probably dozens of different um, lessons or strategies right. or techniques that you have that you can pull out of your hat at any given moment. <laughs> but is there a particular yeah. uh, tried and true lesson that you feel you're, you're able to get kids moving with their writing pretty quickly uh, right. using this particular prompt or mentor text or approach. Yep. What, what's your favorite uh, lesson if you had to pick? Yeah, I, well, I, I things. one, um, I love to do, I love to start my semester off with um, honing in on memoir and, and just looking um looking at our lives. Um, so I do a lot of stuff with maps. Uh, one of my favorite books to use is my map book by Sarah Finelli. Um, and it's just a collection of drawings of different maps. And so one of my tried and true favorite things to do is have students map out different things. They might map out their day, 
They might map mm -hmm. out their neighborhood that they grew up in. They might map out um, their bedroom uh, growing up, um, a, a pet. Um, so we look at these different maps. We, they draw maps themselves, and then they write mm -hmm. from those maps. I have them put people and, and different events um, within those maps. I love having students bring in objects from home that are meaningful, mm -hmm. that say something about them, Go, going around the room, sharing those objects with one another um, and writing from them. Uh, same thing with photographs. I ask them to kind of go back through and find different photographs that remind them of different memories that they can um, write about. So I would say for the first several weeks, we do that kind of work because not only um, am I helping the writer develop ideas for, for writing, um, we're also getting to know one another, which I think is a hallmark of a workshop classroom. I think we have to have this classroom centered on trust. And mm -hmm. you can't really trust somebody unless you feel like they know you or where you're coming from. So, um, so that's a big part of what I do at the very beginning. Um, and I do, it my, I do it right alongside them. So I'm doing mm -hmm. maps, I'm writing about my lives, I'm sharing my life as well um, with students. I think the most important thing that I've that I do um, is an author's chair in which the author drives it. So um, I will have different people share in the classroom, but the, but the author who's sitting in that chair is the authority of their, of their work and, mm -hmm. and they should also be the authority of the feedback. So I have an author come sit in the chair and then they tell us how they want us to respond. So the author might sit in that chair and say, um, okay, everybody, I'm going to read my piece and I want you to ask me questions because usually asking questions reveals maybe some gaps that are in the, in the piece that we want to fill in as readers. Um, yeah. An author might sit in the chair and say, uh, look, I have a blank piece of paper. I need you to help me give, you know, get some ideas for my writing. Um, I think also the author might sit in the chair and just say, listen, <laughs> I just need compliments, you know, I've had a rough day or mm -hmm. a rough week and I just need to hear something good about myself. Um, I think that is the, that's kind of a switch that I have done since I was a teacher that I think has really transformed the type of response that authors get in the classroom. And I've, I've done these authors chairs in all sorts of K-5 classrooms and I've just seen such, such power, powerful things that come out because of it. Um, I, I have an interesting story. Um, I had a student in my undergrad class who um, they write these multi-genre projects based on some aspect of her life. And right before our semester had started, she, um, her best friend had been murdered at a house party. And she decided to do her whole multi-genre book around um, her best friend who was murdered. And one of the pieces that she wrote was a letter to the man who killed her best friend. And I remember asking her at the time, are you ever going to do anything with this piece? And she's like, I don't think so. I think it was just a catharsis for me to be able to write this. And maybe five years later, I get an email from her this is long after she had left my classroom. And um, the, the email that she sent me was, I, I did something with that letter. She said, um, the trial finally happened. He had been convicted. And they were at the stage where they had to do victim impact statements. And she said, so I sat in a chair in the, in the classroom and I read that piece of writing to the man who killed my best friend. And she said, it was like the most authentic, pa most powerful author's chair I've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. So I kind of see author's chair as not just something that happens in the classroom, but something that could go outside of the classroom also. Um, and that, that email really, like, really hit me that, whoa, um, this, was, this was something that we did in our classroom that, that really transformed her in some way. So I think those are two tried and true things that I have really hooked on to um, as a writing teacher. Absolutely. Well, and just simply the fact that they share something in your classroom and then a month, a year, five years, yeah. yep. the, the, the real impact of author's chair isn't necessarily in the moment. It's much later on when they it have is. the confidence to share their writing again, or they get to share that piece with a different audience. So 
That's right. very right. powerful. Um, I'm glad that your student had that opportunity. I am too. Uh, I am too. It's amazing. So, you know, to, to kind of keep up with this theme then for just a moment of providing feedback, um, clearly when we're working with our youngest writers and we're trying to move them forward, uh, what kind of suggestions or advice would you have for teachers in terms of providing feedback, maybe both during a conferring session, um, yep. as well as any kind of feedback that they might provide on the writing right. outside of a conferring session to help move the writers forward? Clearly, we can all only focus on so much at one time. Right. And, uh, and for our youngest um, students, I'm imagining that's even more important. But what, yeah. what, what, what advice do you give for teachers as you're talking to them about how to give feedback to young writers. Yep. I think um, when I talk with teachers throughout the country, really, um, conferring is the thing that people are most scared of because you walk into a conference with a child and you have no idea what is going to happen. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's a child sitting there with their piece of work and you're walking in to that session just really unsure of what it is that they that you're going to talk about and i really have three like go-to questions first of all with feedback i think the first thing you do is ask questions um and so you do some research by just by figuring out what's going on with this writer and i have three go-to questions that i usually ask if i don't know what, what else to ask and one is who are you writing this for um the second one is why are you writing this and the third one is how can i help um, I think the first two, what those do is try, I'm trying to tell kids that um, you're writing this for audiences other than me, your teacher, and you're writing this for a purpose other than just getting a grade or doing school. Um, and I know something has run amok if a child's response to those two questions are, I'm writing this for you and I'm writing this to get a grade. Um, I think writing has to be for audiences other than us and for purposes other than doing school. Um, so my first two questions address those two things. And I really want to talk to students about getting their writing out somewhere else, um, you know, to break it out of the four walls of our classroom. Um, how can I help? I think is a really powerful question because it reveals to me, and I, I asked this to kindergartners all the way through uh, college students. It reveals to me where they think, um, or what they privilege about writing. Oftentimes, it's always interesting to me because this is certainly not the message I want to try to convey to kids, but oftentimes kids say, I want help with my punctuation or with my grammar. And seldom, um, I mean, that, I don't know, but a, a lot of times they ask for that. And if they're just drafting, I don't want them to focus on that so much um, during the drafting. It's, it's only when we're gonna take something to publication where I want them to ask me a question like that because grammar does matter. Punctuation does matter to the reader. Um, and so we do need to attend to those things, but not for every draft and, and certainly not until really we're ready for publication. Um, so um, so how, how can I help you is oftentimes uh, just an insight for me into the thinking of a child. Um, so I always think that's powerful. You know, I think it's important for us to sit side by side. Carl Anderson's work with conferring has been really influential on me. You know, he's talking about sitting side by side with a student. You know, it's, this should be a casual kind of conversation. It should be writer to writer, not teacher to student, but really, mm. you know, I'm a writer too. Let me bring my own insights into this conversation. So I think just the stance that we take as, as teachers, um, should be really as co-writers and you know we're both writers in this classroom let's talk about writing together um so those i think are some of my tips for feedback for, for kids that i'm working with right i really uh, appreciate how you just described that that you know what they ask for in the moment with punctuation or spelling is only the tip of an iceberg yeah. and you're really by framing it in the how can i help way it's rather than saying, oh, let's work on, which I think for better or for worse, teachers typically come to that teaching moment with the here, I can give you something, but in, in reframing it as the, how can I help? You know, what do you need to ask of me? 
that makes a big difference. So I can, right. I can certainly appreciate and see what you're saying there. So, right. Well, I think it gives it, the writers an agency as well, you know, um, it allows them to have a voice in the conference, um, which I think the conference should be all about the writer. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So this is a perfect way to segue to the question I've been trying to ask all our guests this season at the end and thinking about the role of writing in your yeah. own life. So when you're sitting next to those students, writer as writer to writer, um, and then you have your own stories to tell, you have your own experiences to bring to bear. So what impact would you say writing has on your own life, both personally and professionally? And how do you see yourself as a teacher writer? Yeah. Um, well, I, when I think about myself as a writer, I, I wonder, like, why, why do I write? <laughs> you know, why do I find writing to be such an important part of my life? And I think what I, what I always come back to is I write to figure out who I am, um, number one. And then I also write um, to figure out what I think about the world. So um, I think writing forces me to kind of slow down and reflect and put something onto a page that helps me make sense of an event or make sense of um, something I see a child doing. And, and I think it really is a record of my intellectual life. Um, if I didn't write, I don't think I would do much deep thinking. I think I would probably live a lot a lot of ways along the surface of life and writing helps me to kind of go deeper under that surface and, and just to figure things out. Um, so that's one of the big reasons why I write. That's why, um, that's why, you know, I feel compelled to publish things is because I want to, I want to create a record of my intellectual thinking um, so that I can maybe pass that forward to somebody who it might help, who might read something that I've written and be um, somehow changed because of it. Um, mm. I also think of writing as a gift that, that keeps me and others alive long after we're gone. Um, mm. So I recently, I, I have been one of these lucky people who have had their grandparents and their lives well into my um late thirties and now I'm in my mid forties. Um, and my grandfather died, I think maybe five years ago. My grandmother just died about three years ago. They were in their mid nineties. Um, and I think a lot about my grandpa because what he had done in his life, he was an orthodontist, but um, as his hobby, as his um, passion, he was a potter. So he had um, a wheel in his garage and a potter's wheel and he had a kiln in his garage and he would come home from work and uh, my grandparents lived at, on the beach um, and he would have the garage door open and you would, he had this ocean breeze kind of coming in and he would make all these pots and these um, vases and these teacups and I mean just all sorts of stuff. And my grandmother, he, he would just have... Um, he would have these shelves full of these things. And anytime we would come to visit my grandparents, my grandmother would always be like, take some, take some, get them out of my house, get them out of my house. <laughs> um, right. And, uh, you know, it, it, he was just so prolific in it that um, we would, we would leave their house every time we'd come to visit um, with a, just an armful of these pieces of art that he created. And now that he's passed away, um, I have these pieces that he created all around my house. You know, my, he, I was lucky enough that my kids were alive when, when he was still alive. So he had made stuff for our kids. And so um, just every, every so often I look over and I see um, a vase that he had created or um, when Christmas time comes, I, he made these Christmas um, vases for, for each of my kids. We pull them out and I think about them. And I think that's what art and writing does for us it helps us to live um helps us to kind of um live long past we're gone and it it keeps us alive i think for for people who love us and care about us um so that's another reason why i write i think i write things for my wife for my kids for my family i wrote my grandfather's eulogy um mm. and i think um 
I think what it does is it just, it keeps, it keeps you present in the lives of other people long after you're gone. So that's another reason why I feel compelled to write. Mm. I, I really like that idea. It keeps us present yeah. in the lives of others. Yes. Well, I appreciate the work that you do with and for teachers, with and for kids. Um, I know that you've got your own kids to get back to now that they've <laughs> yeah. been, uh, they've been they're stuck on screens for a while. And you, you, on fall break, <laughs> but you notice they've been quiet. So They, they have been very <laughs> quiet. It's been wonderful. Yeah. So I thank you, Brian, for your time yeah, today and, and look forward to future conversations and yep. uh, opportunities to learn from you. So thank you so absolutely. much. Absolutely. Thank you, Troy. Writing Matters with Dr. Troy Hicks is a writable podcast. Discover more episodes and subscribe on your favorite streaming platforms or check out filmed episodes on YouTube. And if you want to learn how to grow great writers, check out writable.com.